Okay, everybody, and welcome back. Over the course of the next two or three hours, what we're going to look at is the basics of programming. We're going to be using Python for our examples, but all of the key ideas can be transferred to other languages like Perl, MATLAB, R, Java, C++, Fortran, pretty much everything. Because what we're going to try to do is show you how to program in ways that fit the human mind. As we said at the outset of these recordings, the most important thing to keep in mind, the most important thing to remember, is that you've got a very small working memory. If you want to program successfully, you have to decompose your problem into pieces small enough to fit in that working memory, that magic number 7 plus or minus 2. You also have to rely on chunking. In order to remember and work with larger things, you have to group them together into manageable, memorable units. So where novices want to know about for loops and variable assignments and how do I invert a matrix, the key to programming is actually thinking about how we decompose complex problems into smaller and smaller pieces. We often tell people that the reason to do this is so that you can reuse those pieces. So that once you've written a routine to invert a matrix or calculate correlation or do something like that, that you can use it in other scripts. And that is very important. But it isn't the most important reason. The most important is that unless your program fits into your brain, you won't be able to write it, understand it, or debug it. Now, here at the computer, I'm going to be switching back and forth between two terminal windows. The yellow one I will use for shell commands so that when we're running Python at the shell directly, I'll be typing here. When I want to start writing longer scripts and programs, I will switch to one that's got a white background. So yellow for the shell, white for the editor. Let's start by actually running Python. Now, if you've got a generic Python install, then you just type Python. And it comes up with a prompt telling you which version of Python you've got. I've used the free NThought Python distribution because it comes bundled with a lot of scientific packages. You might have a generic Python from python.org. You might have the one that comes with Mac or Linux. Whatever it is, typing Python at a command prompt will give you an interactive interpreter. You type commands, Python executes them right away. And this triple greater than sign is Python's prompt, where the dollar sign was the shell's prompt. This is all fine and good, but if you really want power tools, there's another Python interpreter called IPython. When it starts up, it looks like this. There's a little bit more verbiage at the beginning, and as you can see, the prompt looks a little bit different. And if I do something like, say, print hello, you can see that it's incrementing the command line number here to show me how many commands I've typed in so that it makes it easier to repeat previous commands. The generic Python interpreter is the one that's discussed in most books, but IPython has a lot of extra features that we think are useful for scientific computing, so that's what we now recommend. So, let's start off by doing a little bit of simple programming. We just wrote our first program. Print the string hello. Character string is double quotes, H-E-L-L-O. And print is a command to Python. It does what you expect. What if we say print 3 plus 4? Well, that gives us 7. What if we just say 3 plus 4? We haven't told Python what to do with this bit of arithmetic. So it says, well, I will show you the result of that expression that you gave me to calculate. And it tells me that the output from number 3 is the value 7. The print statement doesn't have any other output. It actually does something, so there is no output. 3 plus 4 produces the output 7. What about 3 times 4? Produces the output 12. All right. What about 3 times hello? That produces hello, hello, hello. And as you might expect, hello times 3 does the same thing. This is pretty cool. Well, what about adding strings? If I say hello and there, 
it gives me the string hello there. And you'll notice that when it's printing the strings out, it's using single quotes instead of double quotes. In Python, you can use either, and they mean the same thing. If you start a string with a single quote, you have to end it with a single quote. If you start with double, you have to end with double. Some languages treat double quotes and single quotes differently. In Python, they're treated the same. So I can add strings together. I really should add hello plus a space plus there so that it's a bit more readable. Well, if I can multiply a string by a number, can I, and I can add strings, can I add strings and numbers? Let's try the value is and add the number three. Well, the result of that is an error. And it's actually a type error. That's what that red message means. And then it shows me where I am and what the statement is. And then it gives me the error message. The problem is that I'm trying to add or concatenate or do something with a string and an integer. And Python doesn't know how to combine those two types. That's actually not accurate. The real problem is there are two ways in which Python could combine those types. And to see what those two are, Think about what the result of 3 plus the string 4 would be. One plausible answer is that it could be the string 34. We could take the integer, convert it to a string, and concatenate strings. The other possibility is that it could be the number 7. We could take the digit 4, convert it to a number, add it to 3, and get 7. It's ambiguous. Many languages will guess what you want. Python tries not to. In cases where it's ambigua, ambiguous, Python will tell you, you have to decide which way you want to go. So I could say string of the number 3 plus the string 4. So I'm using a built-in function stir to convert a number to a string. And that works because stir of 3 is the string 3. Alternatively, I could say 3 plus convert to integer the digit 4. And that works because int of the string 4 is the number 4. So because there are two or more plausible interpretations, Python doesn't try to second guess you. It waits for you to tell it what to do. There are pros and cons to this. If 99% of the time people want to do things a certain way, it makes sense for the language to support it. At 50%, there's no way the language could know. It'll be wrong as often as it's right. At some point, between 50% and 99.999%, there's a transition. We go from it making sense for the human being to explicitly say what they want to it being more convenient for the computer to guess. Most programming languages, and unfortunately many libraries, make that transition far too early. There are far, there's far too much software out there where you have to know a whole bunch of extra rules in order to understand what's going to happen. The basic principle here is called the principle of least surprise. You should never write something in a program and look at it and go, well, that's surprising, given everything I already know about the programming language, that's completely unexpected. Right? So. We now know how to do simple arithmetic. We could write 3 times 4 plus 5. The th times takes place first, so that's 12 plus 5 is 17. Good, I can still do math. Or we could do 3 times 4 plus 5. We can do 3 divided by 4. Well, if you're a computer scientist, you think that's 0. Because integer divided by integer gives you an integer result in number percent gives you the remainder, which in this case is 3. If I do 5 divided by 4, I get 1. If I do 5 remainder 4, I also get 1, because the remainder, when you divide 5 by 4, is 1. This is, in my opinion, a mistake, because we spend years in elementary school teaching people about fractions. My daughter knows that 3 divided by 2 is 1 and a half. She's very proud of the fact that she knows that. Because it's easier for computer hardware to throw away the remainder when dividing integers, this is the behavior that Python 2.6 and 2.7 and all previous versions give. In Python 3.0 and higher, 
integer divided by integer will give you a fractional result if that's the right answer. In Python 3 and higher, 3 divided by 2 gives you 1.5. So it's important to know which version of Python you're working with because this does kind of affect the result of your calculations. What if I actually want the fractional result? Well, I can do 3.0 divided by 2.0 and that'll give me 1.5. I can also do 3.0 divided by 2 or 3 divided by 2.0 because if either side is a fractional number, a technical term is a floating point number, then that's the way the math is done. If they're both integers, division gives you back an integer result. This is the way that most programming languages work. Python is one of the few that's had the courage to correct it in a later version. All right, dividing three by two is not particularly interesting. Let's see if we can do something a bit more exciting with our interpreter. How about creating a list of numbers? Let's say, actually no, before we create a list of numbers, let's store some numbers in variables. Let's say pi is 3.14159, and, oh, I don't know, mass is 7.5. All right, if I now take a look at the value of the variable pi, I get whatever was stored with it. If I take a look at the value of the variable mass, I get whatever value was last assigned to it. And I can change mass to be 8.5, and as you can see, it's now got the new value. In some languages, a variable means store the data there. And anytime you assign a value to a variable, you always have to use the same type. If you just say that the value is an integer, then the variable always has to store integers. In Python, a variable is just a name. It can refer to data of any kind. So I could say mass is heavy, and now mass is referring to a string. A variable is just a name. It points at a value. Variables don't have types, unlike Fortran, C++, or Java. A variable is just a name, and it can refer to anything. Here, mass was originally pointing at 7.5, then it was pointing at 8.5, and then it was pointing at the string heavy, and that's okay. It's still just a name. Now, you might be wondering why I'm talking about variables and types and showing you how to do simple arithmetic when what you want to do is read that legacy data file and get rid of a couple of columns and reformat the rest. The problem is, in order to do pretty much anything with programs, you have to understand seven or eight basic concepts because even simple programs rely on all seven or eight of those concepts. The individual concepts aren't that interesting and aren't that useful in isolation. So we have to build up a bunch of pieces so that you've got a, a basic vocabulary and you can then go and have a conversation with the computer. And it's sort of like learning any foreign language. If all you know are please and thank you and how to count to ten and the names of a few colors, you can't actually talk to somebody. You need a vocabulary of estimates vary, 500 to 600 words, in order to be able to actually carry on a conversation. Luckily, with programming, the required vocabulary is a lot smaller, but we still have to get through that and give you those seven or eight basic concepts before we can come back and do the things that you actually want to do. Let's move on. 